Hello, this is Dan Joseph with the China Learning Curve. Welcome to our video newsletter for March 2015. As always, we'll start with a quick review of the three areas we think are most important to foreign business people. One, economic performance. Two, economic liberalization. And three, law and politics. And then after that, in this issue, we have what was probably the most high-profile story of March. I'm not sure how else to describe it, but a rather uh, embarrassing diplomatic defeat that uh, America suffered at the hands of China relative to the Asia Infrastructure Bank. So we'll have a quick discussion of that as well. Remember, our goal is to keep you up to date on China as efficiently as possible. Give us five minutes for this video and maybe another 10 minutes reviewing the newsletter, and that's all you'll need. First up, the economy. Virtually all economic indicators in the month of March reinforce the notion that the Chinese economy is slowing. For details on the indicators, please see the written newsletter. But the message that the data sends is undeniable. The Chinese economy is slowing. So having said that, a couple of points to make. Number one, it seems that the stimulatory measures the Chinese government took in the last three or four months, two interest rate cuts and a reserve requirement cut, uh, have not really impacted the economy greatly. Now, they weren't big moves, so there wasn't expected to be a huge impact, but there's been very little to speak of. Uh, secondly, in March, uh, the Chinese also did very little in the way of stimulative measures. Really, all that was done was that uh, down payment requirements for first and second home buyers were lowered. So that'll provide a little bit of support for the real estate market, but won't have a big impact on the entire economy. It's also worth noting that China has been talking about a transition to a new normal and lower growth rates. And in March, they formally lowered their GDP growth target rate from 7.5% last year to 7% this year. This is expected, and it's helpful because it means China won't try so hard to achieve uh, the higher number. Um, so where do we sit relative to the economy? We've said from the beginning of the year that the key to 2015 is how China will balance growth, slower growth, with the debt problem that's been created over the last five years, where debt uh, GDP has reached 250%. China has said it's willing to accept a slower growth rate and will not do anything to damage the national balance sheet. And so far, they've stuck to that. Growth is slower, and they're not pumping a lot of debt into the economy, from, which, from our point of view, is a good thing. Now, the real question is, is growth even slower than they thought it would be? And will that prompt them to do even more stimulatory measures, which many economists think they will do? From our point of view, 6% growth, even 5% growth is still a relatively healthy economy. And we're hoping that the Chinese government will continue to protect the balance sheet and not create a potential financial crisis with more debt. Relative to liberalization, our headline for the month is Big Words, Small Steps. At the National People's Congress, uh, the government reaffirmed the strategy that it's already announced, which is that as the economy transitions to this new normal phase, they will place heavy emphasis on private enterprise and the free market to energize the economy and lighten the role of government within the economy. And as we know, over the last 30 years, China's liberalization program has always been slow and gradual. And that's what we saw again in March. A number of small steps relative to free trade zones, relative to capital controls, even foreign investment, but nothing really decisive. They did announce that they're going to put together a new plan for state-owned enterprise reform. We don't really like some of the key principles in that plan, uh, particularly the emphasis on consolidation, but at least they've said they're going to put together a major plan. So that's now two plans in the works, one to rewrite the rules for foreign investment and now for SOE reform. So we've got small steps and we've got the intention to create new plans, but we don't have our decisive steps. Now you could argue that one of the reasons the economic transition China is going through right now is so difficult is because some reforms were delayed far too long. And you could also make the argument that the best thing that could happen to the economy right now would be some sort of decisive move uh, toward liberalization. Not that the impact would be immediate, but it would send a, a real sign of confidence uh, to those in the economy. So far, China hasn't done that. It's still early in the year. But one thing we'll be looking for is to see if in some area, financial deregulation, hopefully foreign investment and even state-owned enterprise reform or some other area, there will be much more decisive action in towards, terms of liberalizing the economy, which again, although not impactful in the immediate short term, is what China needs to sustain growth over the long term. Just a quick comment on recent developments relative to the brewing trade war on cybersecurity and IT equipment. Just a quick recap. You might recall that the NSA leaks by Edward Snowden suggested to the world that U.S. IT equipment companies may have cooperated uh, with the U.S. government relative to giving the government you know, access to telecommunications and Internet information around the world. So that led to kind of a quick and precipitous decline in IT equipment sales around the world, particularly in China. And in the aftermath of that, the Chinese government announced a number of new rules that 
will make it very difficult for U.S. IT companies to sell products in China. And one set of those rules pertain to selling very sophisticated equipment to banks. Well, in the last month, a couple of things happened in that regard. First of all, um, now both Japan and Europe have signaled their opposition to the new Chinese rules, kind of siding with America on this issue. That was to be expected, but at least it seems like there's going to be a unified front when it comes to uh, addressing these issues. Secondly, the United States made a filing with the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Now, it's not a formal complaint. It's uh, a request for information, really. Basically, the United States has asked China to justify these new rules and to demonstrate that they comply with uh, WTO standards. So that is maybe a first step towards a more formalized process for resolving and addressing these issues. And then thirdly, the Chinese government announced it is delaying the implementation of the new rules in the banking sector. For how long, no one knows, but at least they're pausing. So maybe what happened in the past month gives us an indication that we get on a path toward resolving this issue, which I think has the potential to be a very difficult trade issue. And it is a very complex one involving, you know, cybersecurity, national security, uh, privacy, policing the Internet, and trade issues. So maybe this will put us on a path towards a uh, reasonable resolution to this that will prevent a, a trade. And finally, a comment on America's diplomatic defeat relative to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The background is this. As many of you probably know, when it comes to multilateral lending institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, the United States plays a dominant role. And for the Asian Development Bank, Japan plays the dominant role. In fact, in certain circumstances relative to the IMF and the World Bank, the United States has veto power on whatever the institution does. Well, for a number of years, emerging economies, not just the Chinese, but also India and the Brazilians, have wanted a greater say in those institutions. And frankly, the United States has kind of dragged its feet in terms of, in terms of addressing those concerns. Uh, it took a while for the administration to agree to a particular proposal, and right now that proposal is kind of languishing in Congress as nobody wants to even vote on it. So it's possible, even if we, the United States didn't drag its feet, the United, the China would have still proposed its own multilateral lending institution, and in the end that's what China did. The Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, China founded the bank and committed to an initial investment of $50 billion. The United States opposed the AIIB on the grounds that it was concerned about transparency and governance of the institution in light of rule of law issues relative to China and China's proposed leadership of the AIIB. The U.S. said it wouldn't join the institution, and of course it uh, was hoping its allies uh, would not join either. And what happened in March is exactly the opposite of what the United States wanted. One by one, American allies decided they would join the AIIB. It started with the UK and then through European countries like Germany and France and Italy, and then all the way over to Asian allies like South Korea and Australia. With the exception of Japan, about every ally the United States has has signaled their intention of joining the AIIB. So you have to admit, I'm not sure if the practical implications of this or as significant as some people think. Um, but from kind of a popular perception point of view, a diplomatic defeat that is this public uh, is not common. And when people say that the United States has egg in its face, frankly, there's, there's good reason. It was not the best month from a diplomatic point of view for the United States of America. While the AIIB situation may have made a big splash, and I think it certainly involves some miscalculation on the part of the U.S., I think the practical implication might be a bit more muted. Anyway, for more information and commentary on that topic, please see our separate post on that and the accompanying video. So that's it for our video newsletter for March 2015. Thanks for joining us. Uh, in the written newsletter, we have additional stories, topics like uh, foreign exchange, the National People's Congress, some political developments. So for those additional stories, and for also for more details on the stories we've discussed, please see the written version of the newsletter. This is Dan Joseph with the China Learning Curve. Remember, give us 15 minutes a month. We'll keep you up to date on China. Thanks.